Today we're going to solve a turning point mystery. It involves a problem that at first looks like it can't be solved with the knowledge that we currently have access to. But actually, we can crack this problem, we just have to be a little more creative in the way that we employ the skills that we've developed in algebra and calculus. So to introduce this problem, I'm going to start with something very familiar, and that's the function f of x equals x squared. Now hopefully you're familiar enough with x squared that you can see by my Cartesian plane we're going to graph this and a picture is already forming in your mind. Now for reasons that will become clear really shortly I'm actually only going to graph part of this function. I'm only going to graph the part where x is greater than zero. So very roughly I think it's going to look something like this. Now the important thing about this familiar parabola shape that I want to draw your attention to is in this domain there is well, an increasing function all the way. Um, there's no turning point in this domain where it sort of becomes a decreasing function. So this f of x equals x squared is familiar to us and I want to compare that to a very similar looking function, has all the same pieces, we're just going to arrange them differently. And that is 2 to the power of x. So if I swap the x and the 2, take the, uh, the number out of the index and make it the base, we get an exponential function. And in this same domain, well, honestly, the function looks pretty similar. Um, it won't have the same intercept at zero down here, it won't pass through the origin. It's actually going to pass through y equals one, if this was the y axis. But then from there, it kind of, like I said, looks similar, it just kind of has this exponential growth feel to it. Now, just like with f of x equals x squared, I want you to notice that this has the quality of being an increasing function all the way through. In fact, uh, 2 to the power of x, even if we looked at it for the, the entire domain, if we didn't restrict it, if I had a look at this part over here, um, it would still be an increasing function for all values of x. But in the domain that I'm interested in, where these both overlap, that's what I want you to notice. So, we've got, let's get rid of this little bit over here on the left, we've got f of x equals x squared, and then we have 2 to the power of x. Now, both of these functions, this quadratic and this exponential are ones we understand pretty well. We understand what happens when you've got x in the base and it's worth noting if I increase that power from 2 to 3, 4, 5, etc. Um, if I do that for the quadratic and if I do that for I should say polynomial because it won't be a quadratic anymore and if I do that for the exponential as well and change these numbers here change them into, you know, oops, sorry, that's not a number, that's the x. If I change this number here or this number here, if I change them into any other values like 3, 4, 5, or you know, 7, 8, 9, etc. Um, even though the scale will look a bit different, the overall shape is still going to be preserved. So, these are the qualities that I'm noticing. In these domains, and I might as well write it down so it's really clear, x is greater than 0, that's the part that I'm interested in for both of these. Both of these functions are purely increasing functions. We could call them monotonically increasing, that's the fancy word, okay? Now, this is, like I said, what happens when the x is in the base, that's what we have over here, or where the x is in the exponent, in the index, like we have over there. What I'm really interested in, and where the mystery comes from, is when we try and combine these two. What if we had an x in the base, and also in the index at the same time? Now, what I'm trying to think about is a function that looks like f of x equals x to the power of x. What's this thing going to look like? Now we can actually explore this in depth and um, I've done this in other places so you can go and look those up if you're interested. But for now let me just cut to the chase and show you what the graph of this thing is actually going to appear like. If I take this function x, well I haven't done anything to it in terms of powers yet, raise that to a power before I put in the x, I just want you to make a prediction in the quietness of where you're learning at the moment. Have a think about what you would guess this thing looks like, remembering what our sort of component functions look like, the things that we've put in together to make this. Um, the polynomials over there on the left, um, they've got this upward trajectory and so do the exponentials over there on the right. Okay, have you got an idea of what you think these things might combine into? Well, you might be a little bit surprised because when we have a look at the actual result, let's put the x up in the exponent. What is going on there? This function, and you might have had a guess at this because of the title I gave to this video, this function has a turning point. What is it doing there? Um, in fact, if we look a little more closely, you can see 
And there's some familiar numbers here. For example, if I put in x equals one, then the function itself is gonna take on the value one to the power of one. So unsurprisingly, uh, you get this point over here. Let's actually just plot it one comma one. Oops, that's not a plot, there we go. All right, so there's one comma one, it sits on the curve. Um, you can see as you go toward the right, it's kind of what you expected. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. No surprises there, two squared, three cubed, four to the power of four. These things are just sort of skyrocketing, right? But then something weird happens between x equals zero and x equals one. Uh, it starts to dip down and then it goes back up. There's this turning point. What's going on here? Um, I'm interested, I guess, in two things here. Number one, why is there a turning point? And number two, uh, where is it? This is often the question that we ask uh, locate stationary points and determine their nature. So we're gonna try and unpack this by using some of our differential calculus. So let's come back over here. Now, if this is the function I'm interested in, let's go over to the left, so I've got some space to work. If this is the function I'm interested in, um, how do I differentiate it? Well, we run into some problems immediately because you kind of wonder to yourself, well, can I treat this function like my two earlier functions? Can I treat it like an x to the power of n function? We know, let's just make a little side note here. We know that the derivative of x to the power of n um, is n x to the n minus one. We you know, multiply by the index and then we reduce the index by one. Well, if I tried that over here, could that work? Well, if I said, uh, let's write this in a, a funny looking color. Let's choose, let's choose brown. If I differentiate x to the power of x and try and bring this down, well, let's see if this actually works out and gives us a reasonable result. Um, the first thing is I'm going to multiply by the index, which in this case is x, um, and then I'm multiplying that by x to the power of, and then I reduce the index by one. So I get, uh, let's see here, x minus one here. Hmm. Okay, now uh, interestingly, if I think this is the, the derivative, um, I can you know, work with this a little more. I can actually say, well, I have index laws, right? And this is x to the power of one times x to the power of x minus one. Now, when I multiply two numbers that have the same base, I add their indices. So I'm thinking that this will give me x to the power of x minus one plus one. Minus one plus one, that's x to the power of x. Now, this is problematic. Uh, this is, once we simplify, apparently the function that we came from. But that can't be right because we know that the functions that have, you know, their derivatives being themselves, are the family of functions that are exponentials, e to the power of x, and um, the, fa the functions like that, e to the power of x, you know, um, shifted left and right and all the rest. So this doesn't match. This doesn't seem right, and we can also see that this must be wrong, because if we come over here and try and think about, well, what would it mean for this function to uh, be its own derivative, we know something is definitely wrong, because if we, uh, let me take a screenshot so I can write on this. Um, if we have a look at this part of the function over here, this part of the function, well, I went a bit too far, maybe, maybe go back to about there, I'd say. This part of the function, is clearly decreasing, it's going down. So its derivative or its gradient function should be negative at that point. But we can see, we're looking at x to the power of x right now, it's never negative. So this is a bust, this is no good. So uh, let's get rid of this, this is not the derivative. Um, I clearly, this approach that I used uh, here to use our, our derivative of a polynomial, it's not gonna work. This is not a polynomial, x to the power of x, so I have to abandon this. So let's get rid of this approach. It's no good. Now, I can then say, well, maybe it's a little bit more like the function on the right. Maybe I should treat this more as an exponential. Now, when we have two to the power of x, um, or a to the power of x, we know that we can say the derivative of a to the power of x is going to be a to the x log a. Hmm. Okay, a to the x log a. So would this work? Could I try this out with this function? Well, if I think, let's go back to my brown working before. If I think that this might work, let's just see what happens. This is actually a really important thing in working mathematically. Even though, you know, you might think something will go wrong, you actually will learn something by giving a shot anyway. So let's, let's just see where this will lead us. If I treat this in the same way, then I'm going to get, I guess, uh, x to the power of x log x. Hmm, 
Okay, well, let's see what happens if I give this a go. This, this will be interesting. If I come back to our function over here, what does x to the power of x log x look like? x, raise that to the power of x, and then I'm going to multiply that by, I'm going to go into my functions here, and it's going to be something like log x. All right. Now, what is going on here? Now, this is much more interesting to me, um, but it's got a problem and you'll see why in a second. Let's, it's interesting to me because if I zoom out, um, this for starters has, um, it, it, it does something that I wanted the previous derivative to do, which it didn't do. Namely, there's a part of this derivative, the gradient function, which is green, is a part of it that is negative. That should make us have a decreasing function. Now, I do have part of it that's decreasing, but it doesn't quite match, does it? Let's again take a screenshot so we can draw on this thing. If I have a look over here, where is the gradient function negative? Well, I pick yellow because it's a more helpful contrasting color. This part down here, this is where the gradient function is negative. So therefore I would expect that the function it came from, which I differentiated, it should be decreasing for this whole time. Now, I'm close, but I'm not quite there, am I? If you have a look at the red function above, it's decreasing for part of that yellow section, but not for the whole part. If you have a look at this part here, you know, the function has gone back to increasing again and the derivative down there, well, yeah, it's not positive like it should be. So this is a bust as well. Let's get rid of this guy because it isn't what we want. So now we've established that our way of differentiating polynomials doesn't work. A way of differentiating exponentials which have a, a, you know, a base like a, a doesn't work either. It doesn't give us the result we want. So what can we do? 